Okay. So we met, uh, I'm Charles Dutrieu, I'm a developer at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory and I'm, I'm on the climate uh, program and I'm here with uh, Carlos, which is the main developer for this lab, which we're going to talk about right now. And, uh, okay. So yeah, I will a little bit about what I'm here, just to talk about the history and give you a context about like, what the lab and what it's about. And then uh, we'll uh, just to get a quick story of my tone and then Carlos will do a demo and then we can talk about where we want to go with that in the future. Essentially. So the history, uh, it always started with the program for climate model diagnosis and effect of the region, CMDI, about 89, which is the study of the And the goal was to do interconferation of climate model like, across the world because back then, no, like everybody had their own model, but they did not talk to each other completely. This MDI has organized the community of modeling and get together and compare the results. And uh, with, by organizing the community, we develop metadata standards and things like that so people could compare the data results together. And that's on the, so on the science sense side, I think this MDI still exists, still there, managing all these things, the choice of these things, things like that. And on the more infrastructure computer side of things, that evolved into its own thing, which is now the Earth system. Uh, Grid the Earth System Grid uh, Federation, ESGF, and uh, which basically is added to this media data uh, in a very way because you can have the data across. Originally, this media used to host everything, but then you get to the end and say you establish ESGF. So, ESGF is really like the computer side of things. And uh, as this MDI was doing more of the science and stuff, they needed to have tools. So, the um, part of the ESGF was tools to help. Reading this data, visualize, do science on it. And so that's a uh, CDAP, which uses that for climate model, climate data analysis operation, but now it's for community. Nice tool because mm -hmm. we're trying to go a little bit outside of just climate, and also for political reasons. And uh, so that became a CDAP. It's five days, based with six extensions, and the core components are CDMS, which is all the IO part. Community data management system, which basically reads the CDF file or over format, understands the metadata, applies them to your arrays, and you know, then you can use smart software to understand what it is it's dealing with. And that leads to the other part, which is BCS, which is a visualization control plot. And because we have all this metadata, we can do a lot of assumption and make the plot kind of quickly. So, all that was nice and incorporated, but we did some kind of GUI part of it. And it's never been, we used to have decent GUIs and it was really bad. And uh, in general, it's been such matter. And also, like, personally, extremely biased against GUIs. I think it's just too easy. So, but so we shifted slowly to web based. And, and that's what this is that is for. So we wanted to have a graphical front end for CDAT for early adopters and people that don't really know the software, they can go around and discover what CDAT is about. And um, we're using so these two core modules to do that for you. And so as I mentioned before, all of it was a standard, and then we decided, okay, it's just too much to ask the users and start using and all these things, so let's do a web browser, web-based application that would be a bit easier. And when we started that, I remember seeing this whole Way back then, it was Jupiter. And I was like, oh, that's what we should use it. But the problem is, it was just starting, and they even in the talk that I don't use that for anything. It's just where we want to go. So we had to do a web based thing. So I kept thinking about this Jupiter thing in my head. In my head. And so we had this here 1.0. It's okay. But then by then, Jupiter was also now a kind of sure enough. And I was like, okay, let's just like, scratch it. And then I think it's time to move to uh, Jupiter extension and do that. Like, in the real way because I realized personally the fact that you can have all the nice clean things about the GUI like whatever you want, but you also get back to the command line. So whatever application we give to the user, we're not boxing them there. We have this extra thing they can go on. And even if there's a bug, I mean it used to be an issue with all the previous GUI, you know, there's a bug or functionality that the user wants, but it you know, like find thing that yeah, I can't really do I don't have that or that doesn't work. And now that the yeah, you can still do it to go to the command line, just you know, add modules and do whatever you want. And then you can still work on the fix it and add this function for you. So I really like that. And that's what you see that two kind of basically came to be. It's a little bit transaction to one on one, little less feature, but we decided to go like super stable. So people have a good 
impression and then we will add features to the way when adoption goes. And, and also we like that we had a, had a good feature people, but features that people really want. And uh, so we had the proof of concept from uh, September to December. So we had to, you know, convince the sponsor that it was worth writing the things in the back and apply and say we just want to take most of it. And I was like, right, <laughs> you know that. But, so but it was like a, uh, no, that worked out. And then from January till uh, last week, we just walked towards the two point zero one relationship. We need to set and uh, I think that's what I was going to do. They will be now. So sure. no further ado. All right. Good morning. Uh, thanks for this opportunity. I'm excited to show you guys what we've been able to get through um, in Jupyter Lab. It's been a total learning experience for me. I started this project just last year, and um, I've actually been pleasantly surprised how how much potential there really is uh, on this platform. So let me just switch quickly here. OK, so I'm doing the risky uh, live demo here. Um, we'll see. So this is kind of your just normal Jupyter Lab environment. So you start off with your files here and everything normal. But what you'll see here is an icon. This is our extension icon. So if you click on this, you'll see some side um, buttons and if you click load variables, it'll just take you back to the file browser, but it's basically indicating, okay, load variables, what file do you want to actually open? So we have a, C, a NC file here. If I click on this, double click, um, we get that error that we mentioned earlier this week, and then you pick your kernel. So now it'll just tell you, okay, we're loading the core modules and Voila. So now it read the file. It said, oh, there's three variables in there. You can actually uh, choose which variables you want to load from the file. Um, you could also subset the variables. So we have like, uh, you know, you could change what axes you want to actually include. Um, uh, we also, if you wanted, you could also rename your variable something else. Um, we'll just leave it at that for now and you load. So what it does is um, it'll inject the actual code that you need to perform that operation. So in a way, it's kind of a, a middle ground between pure GUI and command line. So now you can actually, uh, by doing this, you did the GUI route, but now you know how to do a command line as well. So it's kind of a very powerful way to teach users initially just how to communicate with the backend API. Um, and we have uh, the ability to edit. So, you know, if you decided, oh, actually I wanted to change the subset after the fact, you just click update, it'll quickly put in the next parameters. Um, you could also choose some graphic methods here. So we have a bunch of graphic types. I'll just do an ISO fill. And then we have under that, we have some sub ISO fill graphics methods. So I pick that. It injects it, creates a new variable there. Now I could also choose a template. I'll leave a default for now. If you click plot, it'll quickly do the plot and it'll create a sidecar plot right here. So now you have a plot and it was literally just click, 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 no command, no programming needed. Um, but you also have the code right in front of you if you ever want to change anything or you're just trying to pick it up yourself. Um, the other thing is you can uh, export it. So I just made a plot. Actually, let's. Let's make it a little nicer. We'll do an overlay. So I'll switch to ISO line. So I'm just going to overlay mode, which means I'm gonna plot on top of this. I'm gonna put some lines. So if I click plot again, now we have two plots, one over the other, and I can export that. And I'll just call it test. 
export. So we have it exported. And if we go back here, we see it's right here. So you have your PNG file. Um, there's, if you saw the, um, the dialogue, you saw that there's more than PNG, you can do PDF and all these other types as well. So turn overlay off, plot again. So now I just override. And again, you see it's, it's putting in the code that you would have to do to perform that operation. So it's pretty helpful. And if I decide, oh, okay, now I wanna start fresh on another notebook. Well, that's fine. It recognizes, so I can switch between notebooks and I'll remember what I had selected and what I was doing. I can load another file. Um, here's a larger file. So it's gonna load those. Now this file has a whole lot of variables. This is the file you can't just directly load. Um, but that's the nice thing about CDAT is it lets you kind of subset, pick the data you want to see. You don't have to you know, load the whole file. Um, and we have our search here so we can you know, specify what variable we're looking for. Um, just like that, click it. And obviously you can pick multiple variables, load them all in. Um, so it just loaded all these variables. You can check, uh, pick which one you actually want to plot. Um, you can delete a variable if you said, oh, I, for, I didn't actually want to load that one, delete. Oh, yes, there you go. So it just deleted the variable. It's, I mean, this is simple Python code, but it helps for especially a new user just to see, oh, that's all I have to do, okay. Um, edit, again, so you can see all the different um, axes for this variable. Uh, I can rename it something else, update. So now we actually, we load a new variable and then we delete the old one with that name. But um, again, it's just kind of click, best of both worlds, That one didn't have much exciting data. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so um, we can clear the plot. Uh, we obviously there's a lot of room for new features to be added on there, and there is still so much uh, potential for this. Uh, this is kind of our first actual release and stable, uh, getting it to work with you know multiple notebooks and recognizing what variables, one thing, oh yeah, let me show you another thing. So let's say, okay, I wanna make my own variable. I'll just say CLT2 and I want it to equal CLT times two. I run the code. So now it actually recognized, oh, a new variable showed up. So it actually, uh, keeps track of that. So now I could actually edit this new variable I created and you'll see the parameters match the other because it's basically a clone, but you can still subset it and so forth. It'll automatically put in the correct code for that now. And um, you could save your variables as well. So if I click save, put in tests, or actually I'll just do my bar. Um, dot nc, save. So now we have our variables saved here. Can open that, it'll open like normal, but we'll see that this variable was there. There's also some just uh, little hints here saying, oh, by the way, you already have a variable CLT loaded. So if you load this one, you're gonna override that one. Um, so we have you know little tips that are just helpful if you just forgot something, um, but there you go, just did it. So let's see. Oh yeah, we also have, obviously there's uh, some reference material here. So we have some links here if you want to look up the actual reference material we have online. Um, it's right under the help menu. 
And let's see. You can also not only open .nc files, you could also load XML files, for example. Um, any, any file that is recognized by CDAT as being, oh, this can hold this type of data. So you can just load that. And you see it just opens the correct files and it loads it based on what you wanted. Um, there's more things, but I'm trying to remember what else we can do here. Um, I think the provenance, sure. Um, so let's, let's see, I'll make a plot. Oh, right, can't plot two different variables here. Plot that one. Okay, so we'll export that. And again, we'll export it as uh, test. So now we could also capture the provenance in the PNG itself, actually. So when you export, it's uh, saving the test file and it's right here. So now this is the same type of PNG file on the surface, but um, in the back end, it actually stores important information about the provenance uh, of this variable uh, or this uh, plot, I mean. So you can actually then run one of our scripts that we have in the back end. Eventually we'll put this in the front end as well, but you could actually in your console, you could put in the, the script to actually yeah, oh, yeah, let me. Um, okay. So, oh, and, actually, I didn't have that part of the yeah, demo prepared. Oh, that's what I was doing with the console, I thought. Hold on. Yeah, I didn't actually practice that part of the demo. It's just a last minute <laughs> addition. Uh, I can it. Yeah, if you want, you could take it over and do that part. Just because just it's a cool factor. Okay. okay, I can see it here. Just do a new terminal here. And then uh, just making sure we have a good Python. Yeah, and I think it's called generate. See that notebook. I don't want to search because I don't remember all the options. Yeah. And minus I is it test two you call it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think. So here's the option you can actually recreate the whole conda environment and everything. It's all stored into the metadata, but I'm not going to do all of that. I'm just going to say manage mm, and you can give a name for your conda environment that you want to create, but I think I just say run. Or I just yeah. Actually, let's just create a notebook and then let's just create like test two dot happy one notebook. So I'm just going to open the the ping file, and now I've got the test two happy one notebook. And if I click on it, I can choose you know which kernel I want to run it with, and that's automatically generated. So if I had sent my ping to anybody on another computer, they just get the script, and that's how I made that plot. Uh, yeah, so in the ping, we have all the information. We have actually the whole YAML for the Conda file. So that's the one limitation is if I do it on a Mac and I send it to you, you're on a Linux, it's just not being able to generate the Conda. But you could still generate, the, you can still generate a notebook though. So, for, you know, you have to manually create your Conda environment, but you will know exactly, I mean, it can tell you which version of every package was used. So. It's just a YAML is a YAML for Mac, so it will bar from corner. But. So what does the PNG file look like? Does it have some yeah, basically a dictionary as, as a header somewhere. Okay, so you go back yeah, to the yeah. slides now. Give I think that's the end of our demo, live demo there. Uh, go back to this. Okay, so, um, so that's where we're at now with our 1.0 release. Uh, there are definitely, as mentioned before, 
room for improvement, uh, things we want to do up ahead. So one thing is um, getting some tutorials just to uh, acquaint people with the actual UI, just so they know, oh, this is this will open a box and now I can use the sliders and so forth. So we have, um, I've already got some prototyping done on that. We're thinking of using some uh, Joyride tutorials, those point and click kind of things, point out different features and you click on them. So that's something we want to do. And then we'll put a little link under the help menu. Um, also, uh, just allow you to actually get a dialogue for the files so you can actually select the NC files and not have to see all these other files that aren't related kind of thing, letting you save to different places um, like a local file system. Uh, also incorporating some color maps. So our previous uh, 1.0 version had a GUI for, you know, making your own custom color maps and modifying your graphics method with that. So we'd like to, you know, bring that functionality back as well in our 2.0. Um, so we're definitely looking at a lot of new ways and it's really promising to see that the community itself is just creating so many new tools, you know, uh, to actually make a lot of these things uh, not only possible, but actually not that, you know, you don't have to reinvent the wheel kind of thing. A lot of things are actually already being done. Um, uh, add some average standard deviation and weighted average options when you're loading your variable. Right now we let you subset it and choose things on the axes, but there's more that we actually can do behind the code. So we just need to update the UI to let you do that as well. Um, and then obviously uh, get user feedback, find out what it is that, you know, other helpful features that people are looking for, especially when they're working with our uh, tools, data analysis tools, what, what more would they like to see, any shortcuts or just helpful features that they can find themselves using a lot. Um, and then for the community overall, so this is, uh, this is kind of like one thing we're working towards, but um, the Earth System Grid Federation itself has a lot of front end tools that, that separate teams and groups are developing. Um, they're all very cool and diverse, but they're not, they're not all kind of integrated. They're not unified in a way. So if you switch to a different tool, you know, it's a whole different UI and all that. Um, we feel like the Jupyter ecosystem and the Jupyter Lab platform gives you this opportunity to actually kind of put a lot of things together, unify this group of um, applications in a way that uh, would just be, you know, you can have like a climate data analysis suite of tools and so VCDAT would be one part for the visualization, but um, we're thinking, you know, you can have like a search download um, app that would, you know, let you download data from Globus and, uh, or, or C uh, CWT. There, we have several different applications and we feel like they could all intercommunicate and also connect on this platform through a front end uh, way. Um, that's one of the great things about Jupyter Lab is just it has that extension uh, mindset where you know you can create these powerful extensions that they they allow you to do so much. It's not um, you can basically become almost like part of the architecture, and I think that's just a very uh, forward-thinking decision on the architecture. And I think there's definitely room for us to take advantage of that. Um, those possibilities. Um, also, like right now, our app mainly works with Python, but there's other languages that the backend code you could actually write. So it'd be nice to uh, allow other types of, you know, kernels and a um, lot of uh, room for, like uh, earlier this week, we saw a lot of presentations on. Um, improvements that are being worked on and extensions um, for like file streaming, for instance, to get rid of what we were doing there that gives you that little error message that can be corrected. There's a lot of room for all of that stuff. So if you want to try yourself out, there's a link. Uh, we have a GitHub page and with that, are there any questions?
Okay, we have time for like five minutes or so for the questions. Uh, if you do have a question, raise your hand and I'll try to run to you as not possibly as possible. Jason. Speaker code generation, is it always append only? Is it, or, or, or are you ever trying to parse code? Um, we could actually, uh, some of the earlier code that I had would actually rewrite it. Um, but we figured for now we would just go back to appending in, in certain cases. I know the capabilities there and I've used it. So I think, you know, in the future, if we find a need for, let's say, uh, we just want, if they click this button, it'll just rewrite that cell instead of create a new cell that is actually a possibility. So there's definitely, um, we could definitely do that. Uh, for now, we just decided, okay, well, if they want to open a file, for instance, we'll just open it and then close it. Uh, I used to, in an earlier version, it would actually create a header cell where it would open the files there and leave and rewrite it there. Um, but we decided to kind of move away there because, well, what if they actually want it to be closed because they're going to modify it later or there's things like that. So we consider that too. This is cool. I guess one question I have is uh, the code injection stuff. Uh, you guys sufficiently like, modularize that so it could, it could we use that for a different project? Like if we want to have this kind of functionality. Yeah, yeah. So um, early on, so this was kind of a uh, we kind of brushed over this, but when we were trying to get a demo out, we kind of just needed it to work, so we mashed it all up. But uh, since the release, actually, I spent probably the last month or so not only cleaning up the code and adding features and making sure it's stable, but I also worked on modularizing it more. So, uh, for instance, all of our code injection commands are put in a separate file for Python commands, um, and then I have a separate utility library that just has some really simple functions that will, you know, tell the Jupyter kernel, oh, send a request for this code, get back the results. So we have functions that could easily just be implemented. Um, and we have a code injector library, which it used to be, you know, the different components, you click a button and it'll do the injection. I moved all of those commands into a separate module so that now if you ever want to add a new injection command or remove, it's all in one place. So it's definitely more modularized and uh, it's pretty easy to add or modify from that point on. Yeah, sure. Yeah, that's, uh, that's something that I'm really trying to push out to the Jupyter community. Like, that's the end of these tasks to do these things. Because we just you know, did it, it worked. And we made it to custom so we can easily edit or you know, you could do it. But I would like to have a standard some kind in the doc registry somewhere where we just say, hey, this is my function, we need to return that. And then you can, and you know that it's called R kernel, it's our Python kernel, and then you can implement whatever you want. And then you get my extension and they work just the same, it's just detect under the hood, like, oh, now this person is running my extension with R kernel. So I just run this bit of the injection code, which is for R. But just like there's nothing yet. And, Trying to organize people around that because I think that because then we can have you know extensions talk to each other and inject more things and, and that's why I want to do is we want all our extensions to be able to communicate. I think reuse as many as I think the idea of code injection in general could be a tough thing. Like, I mean, you could have an empty code injection if you have a lot of components. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, 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 so if it all use the same thing, the same thing, that would be pretty yeah. 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 Um, really cool demo. I was curious, like, so in the panel there, you, you made that, um, that copy of an object, but you cloned it. Mm -hmm. is it. Is it just listing certain types of, um, uh, yeah, so if you had seen me create a new variable like a equals five, that wouldn't show up. It's only going to show up the variables that actually yeah. are CDMS variables that have the, you know, have, right. And we, yeah. 
yeah. That way your drop down doesn't get like flooded with non-important variables. Yeah.